Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine brought to you by AACC and the Clinical Chemistry Trainee Council. View this and many more pearls as well as other free educational material at traineecouncil.org. Hello, my name is Margaret Newman McCourt. I am an infectious disease doctor at the University of Chicago. Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine on Clostridioides difficile. Clostridioides difficile, formerly known as Clostridium difficile, or C. diff, is an anaerobic spore-forming gram-positive rod that was first isolated in the stool of infants in 1935 and was identified as a cause of diarrheal infection in 1977. It was originally called Bacillus difficilis, as it can be very difficult to culture without strict anaerobic environments. C. diff is an ubiquitous organism found in the environment. It has been isolated from the stool of many mammals. From its initial discovery as a pathogen, C. difficile incidence has increased exponentially and is now considered one of the most important nosocomial infections in the world. C. difficile is acquired when an individual ingests endospores, which travel through the acidic gastric environment before germinating in the intestine. When antibiotics or other insults change the balance of an individual's gut bacteria, germinated C. difficile begins to overgrow and colonize the large intestine. However, many people with C. difficile colonization do not get sick for reasons that are still not yet clear. C. difficile causes disease through the actions of two toxins, A and B. Toxins produce enzymes that disrupt the structure of the gut epithelium, leading to breakdown of the mucosal barrier and subsequent inflammation and secretory diarrhea. The cytotoxic inflammatory response of colonic mucosa promotes the development of a pseudomembrane on the colon wall, which also perpetuates symptoms of diarrhea. Several studies have shown that an individual's intestinal biodiversity is inversely correlated to the likelihood of developing C. difficile disease. This is likely how systemic antibiotic use increases the risk of C. difficile infection. Between 2 to 5% of healthy adults are colonized with C. difficile. Epidemiologic studies estimate that 3 to 26% of hospitalized patients are colonized with C. difficile, but the majority will not develop C. difficile infection. These asymptomatic carriers of the bacteria contribute to C. difficile transmission and C. difficile infection rates in healthcare institutions. C. difficile infection occurs in less than 1% of hospitalized patients in the U.S., but the incidence has doubled in the past three decades. C. difficile is now the most common nosocomial pathogen. C. difficile infection incidence is higher in immunosuppressed populations, such as solid organ or stem cell transplant recipients. C. difficile is especially prevalent among individuals with frequent healthcare exposure, including nursing home residents and dialysis patients. Although C. difficile has been identified in patients in the community, the infection remains much more prevalent in the hospitalized patient population. C. difficile has now been identified in most countries of the world. C. difficile colonization, or asymptomatic C. difficile, is defined as a positive C. difficile diagnostic assay without symptoms. A C. difficile infection, however, is the presence of a positive test in a symptomatic patient. The symptoms of C. difficile infection are variable among individuals, ranging from mild diarrheal illness with more than three bowel movements per day to potentially fatal fulminate colitis. In addition to diarrhea, patients with C. difficile infection may experience abdominal pain, nausea, fever, stool incontinence, and decreased appetite. Physical exam may show abdominal distension or tenderness. Laboratory evaluation often displays marked leukocytosis, though immunosuppression and concomitant infections may obscure this finding. In severe C. difficile infection, patients can develop lactic acidosis and septic shock. Several risk factors have been identified for C. difficile infection, including antibiotic use, prolonged healthcare exposure, including hospital length of stay, as well as resident in a healthcare facility, and immunocompromised status. Age over 65 years has been particularly associated with increased risk of C. difficile infection. Some studies have also shown increased risk of C. difficile infection in patients on proton pump inhibitor therapy, though more recent studies refute this. Antibiotic use remains the main intervenable risk factor for C. difficile infection. Certain categories of antibiotics have been found to be more frequently associated with C. difficile infection risk, including cephalosporin, clindamycin, and fluoroquinolones. Recurrence of C. difficile infection is extremely common. Up to 25% of individuals who are treated for C. difficile infection will develop recurrent symptoms. There are multiple diagnostic tests available for C. difficile detection. 
C. diff was historically difficult to grow, even in strict anaerobic culture, with a sensitivity around 67 to 75%. A selected media, cycloserine cefoxetin fructose agar, has facilitated culturing C. difficile, but this method still requires several days and a separate toxin confirmation assay to make a diagnosis of C. difficile infection. Cell cytotoxicity neutralization assays, CCNAs, detect toxin directly in the stool, but are also labor and time intensive. In the 1990s, enzyme amino assays, or EIAs, began to replace toxigenic culture for the diagnosis of toxigenic C. diff. Toxin EIAs use monoclonal antibodies to detect either of the C. difficile toxins, A or B. Alternatively, an amino assay for the glutamate dehydrogenase GDH enzyme utilized by C. difficile detects the presence of the bacteria itself. GDH EIA has a sensitivity between 81 to 100 percent and a specificity of 82 to 92 percent, whereas toxin EIA is only 58 to 96 percent sensitive, but 95 to 100 percent specific. Two rapid amino assay tests may be combined to optimize the sensitivity and specificity of toxigenic C. diff detection. Nucleic acid amplification testing, NAT, detects multiple genetic targets of toxigenic C. difficile with a sensitivity of 93 to 98% and a specificity of 98 to 100%. This type of testing often gives the most rapid results, but is prone to false positives. CCNA testing has both high sensitivity and high specificity, but is not practical in the era of rapid diagnostics, except to compare newer diagnostic assays. The decision to use toxin or NAT-based testing has been a controversial topic for several years in the infectious disease community. The algorithm here explains these options for C. difficile diagnostic testing and the pros and cons of each testing type. Because asymptomatic carriers can have a positive GDH EIA or NAT test even when there is an alternative cause of diarrhea, and because tests are sometimes ordered in the absence of clinical symptoms, some experts advise against using these as a single step test to the risk of po false positives among colonized individuals. When used initially, low sensitivity toxin based EIAs may miss true diagnoses of toxigenic C. difficile infection in patients with intermittent toxin in the stool. Thus, the high negative predictive value of NAT or GDH EIA testing makes these appropriate initial tests in a two step algorithm, followed by toxin EIAs to confirm the diagnosis. The IDSA SHEA guidelines recommend that, when available, Institutions implement either such a two-step toxin-based testing protocol or a single-step NAT-based testing if there is approved upon institutional criteria for C. difficile testing appropriateness, such as requirements that stool be liquid for C. difficile testing to be performed. All C. difficile assays have the potential to be misinterpreted by providers who do not understand such nuances, especially in hospitalized patients with other potential causes of diarrhea. And several drugs have been found to be effective in the treatment of C. difficile infection, including metronidazole and oral vancomycin. In more recent past, a novel macrocylic antibiotic called fidaxomycin was designed specifically to treat C. difficile. Fidaxomycin has been proven to be as effective as oral vancomycin in treatment of acute C. difficile infection and may decrease the risk of recurrence. Bezlotoximab, a monoclonal antibody that binds and neutralizes C. difficile toxin B, has been approved as a single-dose adjuvant treatment for C. difficile infection. It decreases the risk of recurrent infection when used in combination with vancomycin or fidaxomycin courses. Several expert societies, including the Infectious Disease Society of America, Society for Hospital Epidemiology, and American Society of Transplantation, have recently updated their guidelines and recommend treating first episode of mild to moderate C. difficile with either 125 milligrams every six hours of oral vancomycin or 200 milligrams every 12 hours of oral fidaxomycin. These are also the recommendations for treatment of first recurrence of C. difficile infection. For severe or fulminant C. difficile infections, a 500 milligram dose of oral vancomycin given with intravenous metronidazole is recommended. Other medications such as tigacycline and rifaximin have been shown to have activity against C. difficile, but are not recommended as primary treatment. Fecal microbiota transplantation, or FMT, has been shown to be a safe and effective treatment for recurrent C. difficile infection, though this treatment is often reserved for patients who have failed alternate treatment options since this typically requires endoscopic administration. Additionally, the few commercially available FMT formulations can be expensive and not very standardized. Together with stopping systemic antibiotics, 
FMT has been shown to be the most effective treatment for recurrent C. difficile infection. Infection may recur in patients treated with FMT if they are exposed to antibiotics again, emphasizing the importance of the gut microbiota in the pathogenesis of C. difficile infection. In some cases of severe fulminant C. difficile infection, toxic megacolon can develop, which carries an associated risk of intestinal perforation. Patients with a high burden of infection may develop bacteremia or reactive arthritis. Dehydration and hypoalbuminemia related to severe C. difficile diarrhea can lead to acute kidney injury, sepsis, and death. The mortality rate for C. difficile infection is 5%, though this may be up to 30% in intensive care units. Mortality is increased in patients with immunosuppression, older age, multiple comorbidities, and kidney failure. C. difficile is a uniquely challenging pathogen in the healthcare environment because it is very difficult to eradicate. C. difficile endospores are resistant to commonly used quaternary ammonium cleaning agents and 70% ethanol hand sanitizer and can persist on environmental surfaces for months. Hand washing is vital to reducing transmission of C. difficile. Healthcare workers are prominent agents of transmission in outbreak settings. The implementation of isolation precautions for patients with C. difficile infection is recommended by multiple guidelines to reduce C. difficile transmission in healthcare facilities. Such precautions often include private patient rooms, mandatory hand washing, and disposable gowns and gloves when contact with any portion of the patient environment is expected. Hospital rooms where C. difficile patients have been treated should be terminally cleaned to reduce risk of C. difficile transmission to future occupants. This should include sodium hypochlorite solution or chlorine-based bleach as strengths of 5,000 parts per million left in place for at least 10 minutes. Antibiotic prophylaxis with either oral vancomycin or oral fidaxomycin may decrease C. difficile infection rates in patients at high risk for such infections, such as those on systemic antibiotics. There is not much data to recommend the use of probiotics to prevent or treat C. difficile infection. Reducing or avoiding antibiotics when able has consistently been shown to be the most cost-effective intervention to prevent C. difficile infections in patients at risk for these infections. Current research in C. difficile focuses on the gut microbiome and its role in protecting against C. difficile infection. Although fecal microbiota transplantation may replace gut biodiversity, this is impractical as prevention. Other areas of research include bile salt conjugation process and its role in C. difficile toxin production in the colon, as targeting this pathway could lead to vaccine development. It remains unclear why some individuals who are colonized with C. diff do not get sick. So detailing the host response to C. diff at the genetic and molecular level is also of interest. In conclusion, C. difficile represents an important pathogen that continues to cause significant disease among some of the most vulnerable patients. Please remember your role in preventing C. difficile infections through antibiotic stewardship and regular hand washing. And only treat a positive C. difficile result if the patient is symptomatic. Thank you for joining me on this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine on Clostridioides difficile. For more like this, as well as articles, podcasts, and more, please visit the Trainee Council at traineecouncil.org.